It is the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome you. Let me welcome everybody to this week's Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's host, creator, and chief cat herder, and I'll be your guide to the next hour of conversation about the future of higher education. I am absolutely delighted to host uh, Sunny Ramaswamy uh, for several reasons. One is that he is the president of a major accrediting body. We haven't really talked about accrediting very much on the forum. And in fact, in the higher education, accrediting agencies are usually kind of like dark matter. They, they don't really appear publicly, but they influence all kinds of stuff. They're incredibly important. So I want him to be here to help us understand what accrediting agencies do and how they are reshaping higher education. Second reason I wanted to bring him on board is because he's an amazing person. He's an absolute delight. This is the best picture of an accreditor I've ever seen in human history, um, and I'm just delighted to bring him on board. So let me welcome Sunny Ramaswamy coming to us from uh, a bit west of here. I ask people to introduce themselves in uh, all kinds of ways, and I shared with everybody your extraordinary, brilliant background, um, your academic work, your work at the USDA. But on the program, I'd like to ask people a different question to introduce themselves, which is, when you look ahead for the next 12 months, what are you going to be working on the most? What's going to be top of mind? What are the biggest projects and ideas for you? Oh, wow. The top of mind is going to be making sure that uh, we do everything with grace and kindness. That, uh, you know, we have all these requirements and all these deadlines and things like that. But we also have to be cognizant that the institutions that we support in the, the accreditation realm, uh, they've got their own challenges. And, you know, I'm sure we're gonna talk about some of those challenges in just a little bit. And just yesterday, day before yesterday, I had a conversation with our tribal colleges in, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Alaska Native Serving Colleges. And, and there are some things that are happening there on, on their campuses that uh, are, you know, even more challenging. And so we've got to do everything we do as an accreditor over the next many months through this, uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic and beyond. I think there's going to be beyond uh, with uh, a grace and kindness and, and remember that we need to put our shoe, uh, ourselves in their shoes in, in how we help support them. So that, that's top of mind for me and for my colleagues as well, my staff as well. I understand. I understand. And uh, I appreciate that a great deal. Uh, it sounds like um, your accreditation agency has uh, an awful lot of work ahead. Uh, friends, if you're, if you're new to the Future Transform, let me just quickly explain. I'm going to ask uh, President Ramaswamy a couple of questions, but the forum is a place for you to ask your questions. So again, remember there's two buttons at the bottom of the screen, that raised hand and that question mark. Uh, this is a great time to ask questions. So if you have questions right now, and a couple of you already sent me some, uh, this is a good time to do that. But also as we talk, as topics come up, uh, and please feel free to ask your questions. And believe me, this is a complicated subject. It's going to cross a number of domains, uh, everything from institutional structures to curriculum to pedagogy to policy to finance. So don't at all feel nervous about asking a question. This is, a, this is just the place for you to ask those questions. Um, so my, my first question for you um, really is, Looking at higher education in this atmosphere of crisis, um, and it's not just this year's crisis, it's also ongoing trends that you and I have talked about before. What is the main function of accrediting agencies? Well, you know, so the crisis, uh, there's always going to be some crisis uh, and, uh, that, that our institutions have to deal with. And, uh, you know, if you look at the last, uh, let's say about 10 or 15 years, there's been multiple crises that our institutions have had to deal with. And there's always this underlying level of budget uh, challenges and things like that as well, that every institution has to deal with. And, and from our perspective as an accreditor, I mean, you know, our marching orders come to us, as you know, from the, the federal government and the Department of Education. So we're ones that interpret the regulations and then create our standards and uh, requirements and policies and things like that and apply it in the context of our institutions. And so whether there's a crisis or not, of whatever that crisis is, whether it's a local crisis or a, a global crisis, our institutions still need to make sure that they're adhering to the standards, they're adhering to the requirements and things like that. And, and if they're going to make any changes on campus, 
because they have to deal with their particular crisis, then they have to inform us and keep us aware of what's going on. For example, mm-hmm. let's say there's going to be a, there, there are budget cuts that are going, happening right now, and we can get back into the COVID-19 pandemic a little bit uh, deeper as well. But let's say there are these budget cuts that are, that are happening right now, and an institution makes the decision that they're going to go ahead and reduce their footprint, eliminate some of the programs, maybe shut down a college or a, a degree program or whatever. They just can't make that unilateral decision saying that I'm going to go ahead, you know, I'm the president, I'm the chief financial officer, I'm the provost, we're going to make this decision. It is a collaborative conversation that takes place, but they got to bring us in as well. In fact, they got to bring us in right at the mm-hmm. outset to make sure that we're aware that they're mm-hmm. going to be doing this. They have to submit to mm-hmm. us what is referred to as a substantive change proposal as to what that change is going to be. And our focus really is what's the impact on those students. If you decided on going ahead and shutting down a program, or or reducing its footprint. I want to know what you're going to do with the students that are currently in the program. That's a critical part of it. So that's, you know, some of the things that our institutions need to be aware of. And, and there are crises, they come and go, but they still need to be mindful that they're keeping us front and center. So what we, the way we work, uh, and, and, you know, it's very similar with my other uh, sister organizations as well, is uh, we have what we refer to as an accreditation liaison officer with, at each of our campuses. And, and my own staff, uh, we have, uh, they are liaising with their institutions. Each one of my uh, vice presidents has approximately about 40 institutions or so. And they're in constant touch. It's not like a one and done, okay, once every seven years, we're gonna check in with you or whatever. My staff and me as well, we're constantly engaged with our institutions and the accreditation liaison officers are also constantly engaged with us. So there should be absolutely no surprises. And we adhere to this principle of continuous process improvement, by the way. And in light of that sort of uh, adherence to that continuous process improvement, the intent is really to stay in touch. There should be absolutely no surprises. Crises may come and go, but there should be zero surprises. That's the approach that we're using. Who is the, just for basic background, uh, on a given campus, who normally is the primary point of contact with their accreditor? Yeah, so on the campus, it is, uh, as I referred to, we call them accreditation liaison officers. And they typically uh, report to the provost. They typically work in the provost's office. And uh, they may have a background in academics. They may have a background in institutional uh, research. They may mm-hmm. have a so it's a sort of a continuum, you know, and academically, they may have be, you know, a professor have been a professor in engineering or a professor in uh, math or uh, psychology or whatever. And they what, what we look for in, in these accreditation liaison officers, ALOs, as we call them, are certain characteristics that they must have have. They must have that lived experience of having been an academic. They must have that lived experience of uh, some level of administrative uh, responsibilities and administrative experiences and things like that as well. And absolutely, there's a requirement. The president or the chancellor or the CEO of the college or the university appoints these ALOs. They must be bought into this. That is not like the ALO sitting out there. And, and, and Brian, you remember, and some of your audience remember this as well, and maybe that's the situation on campuses even today at some of those campuses, mm-hmm. is... Accreditation sits out there in left field somehow. Professors are doing their thing. And then, you know, letter goes from the accreditor saying, oh, y'all need to be ready for your accreditation coming up in 2023. And the provost and the president say, okay, you, ALO or whatever counterpart, go take care of it. So they get all the data. They put together the report. It's totally divorced from the people that are the practitioners, the boots on the ground, educating, involved in the student and all that. We, in the last couple of years since I came on board, we've changed this whole thing completely. We want our faculty to be engaged in this, our staff to be engaged in it, our students to be engaged in it as well. Uh, Our focus, by the way, is um, exclusively laser focused on student success and closing equity gaps. And if that's the premise, you got to have the people that are involved in helping make that happen, that vision of student success and closing equity gaps happen. They need to be involved in this as well. And we're also very data and evidence informed. So the president and the provost and the chief financial officer, et cetera, need to be really, really bought into this. And uh, that's the approach that we end up using. So the ALO is a critically important part of it. And, and we offer them in a constant level of training and all that too. As I said, my staff, uh, uh, particularly my vice presidents, they, you know, the Northwest Commission liaisons, 
they are in, in constant touch. You know, they're on speed dial uh, with those ALOs, by the way. Well, by the way, for everybody who is uh, uh, joining us right now, or if you haven't been here before, if you look in the bottom left edge of the screen, you should see a kind of tan or yellow colored button that, has, that says NWCCU. And that'll take you right to uh, Sunny's organization, the Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities. So if you'd like to learn more about the organization, you can find out more there. Uh, thank you for that for that great answer. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your laser focus on student success and equity. But before I can ask more questions, already the forum community is going full bore. Uh, so to begin with, let me just uh, uh, share this note from a longtime friend of the program, uh, Tom Hames. Um, he asks, uh, in what ways can accrediting bodies drive the kinds of systemic changes that the pandemic has exposed as being badly overdue? Wow. Uh, that's awesome. What a, what a fantastic question. And, yeah, and yeah. indeed, we see this happening across our institutions. And I, you know, I have conversations with my counterparts as well across America. And, and we see these disparities that the, the ugly disparities that we have in America that was already there at some level, you know, and, and those disparities have come to the fore. And then, of course, the events uh, uh, that occurred, the horrific killing of uh, uh, George Floyd, the <laughs> pandemic, all of this has brought up these incredible disparities that we've got. And so uh, it, it's going to, you know, in our case, uh, I cannot speak for my other counterparts, but in our case, the Northwest Commission very specifically, we had already set into motion. We went through this iterative process of uh, updating and revising, reviewing and revising our standards and things like that, where we had eight standards before, by the way. We, you know, based on this iterative conversation, we had input from thousands of people across our uh, region mm -hmm. and nationally as well from think tanks and other places that we sought input from. We held town hall conversations, et cetera, et cetera. What should we, we be focused on? And at that time itself, these disparities and other things started coming coming up, cropping up as something that, that the accreditor needs to be, uh, you know, engaged in. And that helps push the institutions as well to go ahead, become much more meaningfully engaged. You know, we've all been in the situation where, uh, uh, you know, it's a check the box type of approach that we've used. You know, for example, affirmative action, equal employment and things like that. Hey, I, I'm, I'm signed up to doing it. But oftentimes, again, like the ALO that I referred to, there's some diversity office or someplace in some little bitty office someplace. Yeah, go ahead and collect the data and send it off to the federal government or the state government or whatever that's requiring it. But it was not a fundamental buy-in to these things and that we're going to make mm -hmm. at a fundamental level these changes and things like that at all. So our standards, we revise it. We only have two standards. Number one, focus on students, students, students. In fact, as we went around, Having conversations, I co-opted uh, Bill Clinton's uh, famous statement from 1992, is the economy stupid? Stupid. Mm -hmm. I started saying, it's the students, stupid. Mm -hmm. And not just students, but really, and the other thing I would share with everybody, my, one of my favorite, all-time favorite st uh, statisticians jokes is, you know, my head's in the oven, my feet are in the freezer, on average, I'm okay. And <laughs> academia and everything we do looks at averages, right? Averages don't tell us the whole story. These disparities that we've got will never come up to the top if we're only looking at the average. You got to dig a lot deeper. So we want disaggregated data. We want to know the details. And so that's how we approach it. And so we're almost like uh, we caught, in quotes, if I can use this term, caught the wave, as it were, of mm -hmm. the pandemic and the horrific killing of George Floyd and all, Breonna Taylor and all the things that are, have, have happened in America and the intense conversations we're having. My concern is that these conversations that have taken place, it's almost like out of sight, out of mind, you know. Uh, yeah, we talked about it, but let's move on, right? And I don't want us to be to, to do that. And we're now offering, you know, webinars and conversations and things like that that we're doing constantly about these topics. Of course, you know, acad academics is really important. You know, this is the advising, the intrusive advising, use of technology. For example, this medium that we're using in Zoom, everybody got on Zoom, right? How do you go ahead and create community? How do you go ahead? and Because students need to feel like they belong. We know that. And uh, how do you create this belonging here, right? And so we're bringing in, you know, various individuals that have these expertises to help us think this through, uh, you know, assessment and uh, 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 persistence and graduation rates and things like that. We're looking at every one of those, but those disparities that have popped up, we're really helping, trying to, 
uh, make sure that our institutions are involved in those conversations. They're, there's front and center that they need to keep thinking about it as well. That's a thank you, Tom, for the really, really great question. Tom has a genius for asking these kind of deep foundational questions. And Sunny, thank you for um, answering it so deeply, thoroughly, and, and with passion. Um, this does bring up a question that um, another uh, another person asked. Let me just get this. They emailed us beforehand. They couldn't make it, um, which was a question about how an accrediting agency uh, works with different types of institutions. And the person was wondering, what is it? How do you handle the difference between, say, a small uh, college and a large state institution? Again, an excellent question, and this came up in our surveys that we did in the town hall conversations we had, et cetera, you know, the listening sessions that we did as well. And so if, if I'd encourage, uh, you know, your audience to please go to our website if you've not already been there. Look at our standards. There's a pull-down menu, and you can go to the 2020 standards, look at it, and then compare it against the 2010 standards. We've given both of them. And the very first thing that you'll see in there is we honor your mission. Number one. So we've got institutions that are, you know, everybody from a University of Washington, well-resourced with 50,000 students to, you know, uh, a, uh, an institution, a tribal college in Montana, like Little Bighorn College or, you know, one of the other colleges that we've got with significantly more challenging uh, resource issues, much smaller, maybe about two or three or 400 students, et cetera. But they have a unique mission. And then we've got in between, we've got community colleges, uh, and we have uh, faith-based institutions. We've got Gonzaga University, which is a, which is a Catholic university, uh, Brigham Young University, which is a, you know affiliated with the Mormon Church, etc. We've got to absolutely honor their individual specific missions. That's the the, the first uh, statement that we made. And then the reviewers and others that we bring in. They are based on that context, that re lived reality that I like to use that term all the time. So for uh, we've been remiss, you know, for example, for our tribal colleges, which send people that had no background in tribal culture, the spiritual growth that they need to be you know, in, in helping students, you know, inculcate in students as well. And uh, so it's not just numbers, numbers, numbers. You know, it's the very Western uh, sort of a, a scientific approach. We're going to use numbers to look at this. We're going to use data. But what about the qualitative aspects of it? How do you measure it? In fact, we've got a young woman named Alana Hoare at one of our uh, institutions, uh, uh, Thompson Rivers University in Canada, which is, by the way, a First Nations serving institution there up in uh, Canada as well. She has taken on a project as part of her uh, doctoral dissertation uh, to come up with a way to develop qualitative measures. We know the quantitative piece of it. And by the way, we got funded uh, by the Gates Foundation to help develop this, this construct and capacity and infrastructure at our institutions. We're working on that aspect of it as well, particularly focused on the smaller institutions. And uh, so really going back to the comment that I made about we're going to honor your mission. The individuals that are going to come and review you are going to be like institutions. And they'll have had that lived experience. So if it's a, a you know, faith-based institution, we got to have people that come from a faith-based background, as well as others. It's not like you, know, you just want this uh, echo chamber that's been created. I'm only going to only listen to my own people, and I'm doing great and all that. So that's what we've done. And that's the approach that we think is a way to make sure that we can work with the, 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 the very different institutions that we've got from community colleges, Incidentally, we support, we, we work with uh, about 163 universities and colleges. We, our universities and colleges uh, serve about 1.2 million students, mm -hmm. of whom about 400, uh, almost 400,000 are students that come from underserved communities, underserved represented communities, Pell eligible, mm -hmm. yada, yada, yada. You know, I got one college that I just spoke with the president yesterday. Almost 80% of the students there are Pell eligible. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a different context than you know, Gonzaga, for example, right? Yeah. These are the kinds of situations that we've got. We got to take that into account and not just apply. Okay, one size fits all. We're just going to do the same exact thing, you know? And again, as a creditor, as I, I dare say, and I didn't, wasn't involved in this business previously, by the way, uh, we, we, we had that sort of an attitude. It's a, I have a big stick in my hand. I'm going to come in. It's, it's all about accountability. I'm beat up on you. The approach we're using is we're here to support our institutions. We want to have you aspire to... Better and better. That's the intent. And we've also developed a risk-based 
accreditation process as well. We're going to be focusing on our students, uh, pardon me, our institutions and students that are at risk to be able to help them as well. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, and uh, thank you for the question uh, to the questioner. Uh, I have to, it, again, if you're new to the forum, you can see this is all about um, your questions um, and our, our guest responses. Um, we had a, a related question uh, that came up. Let me bring this up. Um, was, um, and, th and this comes from a, a brilliant, brilliant consultant who asks, does planning for 100% day one availability of accessible content, does that factor into accreditation? Uh, I need a little more explication on that. Okay, uh, okay. If, if but, the, but, can, the question can be maybe rephrased, yeah, uh, I yeah. can go in multiple different directions de depending on the interpretation that I'm processing in my mind. Go ahead, please uh, provide a little bit more explication. Okay, I can, I can parse that. Um, so to what extent is accessibility of content important for accreditation? Um, oh, so yeah. Well, we, we don't mean uh, financial, financial ability. We mean yeah. disability. Yeah. disability. Yeah. You know, you're talking about uh, uh, the content itself, right? Yes, and yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, these are all, you know, our premise is, is the students stupid? Mm -hmm. It's about closing equity gaps. It's about these disparities that we've got and things like that. There's a you know fantastic work that's going on. Uh, you know Kelly Hogan, some of you might know, she's at the University of North Carolina. Uh, really, really fantastic work that she's doing. These uh, you know intrusive approaches to teaching and things like that that she she and her colleague uh, Viji Safi have uh, developed. And uh, and so. You know, the, if the premise is the idea that it is the students, that's where it starts from. You got to figure out, and then there are the you know different learning styles and and capacities. I mean, look at the disparities we've got. You know, some kids, as we've seen images, they have to sit in a parking lot to have access to, you know, uh, Wi-Fi and things like that. And in fact, my many of my rural community institutions in my rural communities, including my tribal colleges, are saying we have no way to deliver online content because. You know, Montana, these are, you know, vast acreages, vast areas, and we have no connectivity. I mean, America, that in quotes, invented the Internet. It's a shame on us that we've not come together on making available these sorts of things. So going back to the student, how do you make sure that the access to that content and all that is you know, done in a way that does address these disparities that we've got, lack of access, you know, uh, uh, technological access and things like that too. And uh, so that becomes an important part because we're focused on the outcomes, the student learning outcomes are critically important, assessment and things like that. You won't have student learning outcomes, by the way, if you don't have, you know, courses and content and other things that are accessible, taught, you know, in a way that makes sense. And, you know, today we've got anytime, any place learning modalities that we've got as well. And, and I use the metaphor of our students today being uh, like honeybees, you know, they're into optimal foraging. They go to this institution, that institution, they may take some courses here online. They may be sitting on their, you know, in quotes, but uh, at another institution, it's not like, you know, they come here for four or six years or whatever, and then leave. No, that's not the model that we've got anymore. And so the access of that content and all that, and, and really going back to what's happening in the marketplace, in quotes, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, I'm not talking about the educational marketplace, but the marketplace, you know, more broadly for iPhones or technology or whatever else we've got. <laughs> the students want to sample it. They want to know that the stuff that they're going to get is going to work really, really well. And so our instructors, our institutions need to really pay attention to those kinds of things. And so from an accreditation perspective, since we're focused on the outcomes, you know, our, evalu our evaluators, for whom, again, we're offering lots and lots of training and all that, too, uh, they're going to be uh, paying attention to those aspects of it as well. Well, thank you. Uh, that's a that's a, a really, really solid answer uh, to a good question. I appreciate you wrangling with the question as well. Um, we have um, a few more questions queued up, and uh, some of them are very technical and specific, and some of them are fairly general. So I'm going to start with a couple of the general ones, and then we can uh, plunge into the uh, specific one. And again, friends, if you have any questions, you can see that President Ramaswamy is happy to answer them. Uh, so one of the general questions comes from uh, um, Tom Hools, 
uh, Tom, if I mispronounced your name, forgive me. I think it's Tom Hulls. Um, and, or I'm sorry, David Hull. Uh, and David says that um, in his experience, all too often faculty greet accreditation with fear and trembling. Um, what can be done to soften that fear? Or is, is it just him? Is everybody else besides David happy to welcome every accrediting agency? <laughs> and if you believe in that, I've got a bridge to sell you as well, right? <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, when I was a faculty member as well back in, you know, a few years ago, uh, this was like, as I said earlier, you know, there's a disconnect, has been a disconnect between the accreditation process because there's some stuff to do with the federal government. Because if I'm accredited, then I can get money. Uh, you know, my students coming here can get uh, grants and, you know, financial aid and things like that. Uh, and I can put up a shingle that I'm accredited. But it's sitting out there and, and typically, you know, some, you know, the provost or somebody says, hey, you go do it and come back and tell me it's all done. Right. That was the approach. And I know this. Plus, my wife used to be involved in this and she had seen this happening in real time, uh, you know, helping with the accreditation process on campuses that we're at. And again, this, you know, we got to provide a value proposition. Accreditation needs to provide a value proposition. There's more to it than check the boxes, more to it than some bureaucratic, you know, stuff that happens that has no connectivity. We've got an institution where there was zero buy-in uh, by uh, the faculty. They didn't want to hear anything about it. They sure, didn't want to sure. hear anything about, uh, you know, uh, core competencies and assessment. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd walk around on campus and I say to, uh, and I travel quite a bit, by the way. Uh, even now I do it, you know, through this medium, but I used to physically travel as well. And I just randomly stop at the cafeteria or whatever and ask uh, faculty members, you know, questions. And so if you ask, uh, you know, faculty member, hey, what's accreditation? You know, you get the proverbial rolling of the eyes. And then you ask, you know, what's assessment? Oh, yeah, I assess. You know, yeah, yeah, I give quizzes and exams and all that. Then you ask, well, what about, do you know if your students are actually learning? Do you have some learning outcomes? Do you have, some, you know? So I think we, you know, uh, to, to paraphrase Pogo, I've seen the enemy. As me, I'm the enemy. And as a creditor. And I think really we've got to do everything we can to engage with the faculty. And, and as we went through this conversation of revising our standards and all that, we articulated the idea that we want to make it a fully engaged approach. We want our institutional faculty and staff and students to be really, really involved in it. We just did a, we just finished our, what, today I think is the last of the days of our fall uh, virtual visits. And I was in attendance as, at a few of our virtual visits and I attended the faculty forums and the student forums. I kid you not, and in last spring as well, we had, uh, so we had to make available to this institution, uh, I think like 700 spots for uh, uh, Zoom people to come oh, in. Wow. Yeah. And so you can imagine there's a lot of, you know, interest in things like that. And students, you know, my gosh, you know, we had this one institution, like about 150 uh, in attendance. And, uh, and so uh, I think, you know, we got to uh, provide that value proposition and all of us, I mean, I, I think, you know, all of us involved in the accreditation business, we need to be dealing with the, the boots on the ground that are working with those minds that are the outcomes that we want to look for. Oh, thank you for that answer. Uh, I appreciate the candor and I appreciate the openness. Um, David, thank you for the, uh, uh, for the really good question. We have a, another general question, uh, which comes to another uh, friend of the program, uh, Raj Devisaganam, sorry, Devisaganam, uh, from uh, SUNY Old Westbury. Uh, and he asks two related questions, and I want to bring them up together. Um, one of them is, um, during this pandemic, is accreditation even relevant? And positively speaking, how are you adapting accreditation criteria and standards as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, so Dean Davis, like I am, thanks so much for that question. I say that the accreditation and the, uh, the quality assurance and the accountability and those aspects of accreditation are even more relevant today in the context of what I referred to earlier about the disparities that we're seeing, right, as a result of the pandemic. And then, of course, the horrific uh, events that happened with uh, uh, George Floyd's death, uh, killing, and, and, and the others as well. 
And we need it any, you know, a lot more today than we've ever needed it because you, as the dean of a business school, or, or the other, you know, faculty members or you know other folks that are here from academia, you got to be able to go ahead, and again, you have to provide that value proposition to your your students, to your alumni, to your uh, parents, and to your donors and others as well. And accreditation is not just a stamp of approval that, you know, is like the USDA uh, stamp of approval on a uh, cut of beef, you know. It is that as well. But really, it is that internal motivation to make sure that your faculty, your staff, and others are all doing absolutely the right thing. So accreditation is not an outside thing coming in to do something, but it should be internally motivated. And whether you're in a, in a pandemic or not, the, the, the process of undertaking the self-study that you do, the process of this iterativeness between yourself and your accreditor, and all of these help you really th think of how am I going to do better at what I'm supposed to be doing? You know, uh, I tell you, uh, it's not enough to think that, well, you know, I got a great job. I go in and teach and leave and that's, that's the end of it. No, you know, for faculty, again, we got to demonstrate that value proposition. It's more than just going and standing there and lecturing or whatever that is that you're doing. It is about, for me, the reason that I'm involved in this and, and uh, uh, Brian, you said that in my past life, I worked for Obama, uh, you know, heading the science agency within the Department of Agriculture. For me, my motivation, my internal motivation is to be able to change the human condition, both from a food perspective and from an education perspective. These are two critically important things that can help address the human condition. So for Dean uh, Davis Agayam and, and the others, then, you're addressing the human condition. That's the premise of that we need to go in. And that's what needs to drive this. Not that because, you know, somebody like me is coming around with a stick in my hand or whatever, but it's internally motivated as well. So I think we need, we really absolutely need it very much today. Fantastic approach. Um, I've never heard an accreditor say that before, uh, trying to change the human condition. Uh, on, on Twitter, you have a fan note from uh, Erica Swain who says, Northwest CCU has possibly the best ALO training among the institutional accreditors I know because I tried to mimic it at one of the others. Um, NWCCU, Sunny, and the crew at NWCCU do some great work. So, oh, thank so, you very much for that. Appreciate it. Um, and well, now these are the more general questions. Let's let's dive into a couple of the more uh, specific and policy uh, ones. Uh, we've one from Glenn McGee uh, who, said, who asks, do you foresee the U.S. Secretary of Education waiving financial ratio requirements? All right, uh, Mr. McGee, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, you know, as you as you may know, uh, and I just mentioned it as well. I worked in the federal government as well, and I was a political appointee appointed by President Obama, and then I finished out of the Trump administration. And I was taught that you want to pivot on a question that you have absolutely no idea about that's not in my lane and so i i would you know i don't know you know i, I couldn't answer that question sorry I, if you got some other questions absolutely i'll take it on but it's outside of my lane okay okay I, I, I appreciate, I appreciate. and glenn uh, glenn i know you have more questions so please uh, um, fire off another one uh we have a uh, another very precise question uh coming from the awesome chris mackey uh who asks let me just put this up on the screen what do you see as the major points of uncertainty or lack of clarity still remaining regarding Title IV and accreditation of direct assessment, time independent, competency based learning programs? I'm going to flash flash to another topic. That was a big one. Big one. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Mackey, thank you. Uh, and uh, so, we, I, I think really, I mean, you, the, the word that you've got there, right there at the before the parentheses clarity or the lack thereof and that's the greatest challenge that we've got and i think you know uh, as you know uh, the lack of movement on the higher education act being reauthorized despite all the conversations and you know the republicans tried the democrats tried in the house in the senate all of these things that, are, that have been going on and and there's not you know there's not been you know much clarity that has come out of it and i think you know really going back to the question that you asked uh in regards to title four and, and cbl and things like that the you know that's why many many 
uh, entities like yours and the others are kind of you know in a, in a car in a limbo and you know um, i i hope that the new congress coming in picks it up and provides some clarity and, you know the uh, the as you know we went through this negotiated rulemaking and the neg regs as it's referred to that kicked into gear and actually you know july 1 of next year is when all these things become you know in quotes uh, law and we're, you know, trying to bring our policies and all that up to speed so that they're all aligned with it. And even in those neg regs, and, you know, we've had multiple of those things that's, that have been released here in the very recent past, including on distance education and things like that, too. Uh, again, you know, they've, you know, tightened up some things and, and changed certain th- regs and all that. You know, all of it is okay. We, know we'll, we live by the rules that are, you know, sent to us. We play the you know the cards that we get, and then we'll interpret and and, and apply it to our institutions and all that. Again, in there as well, there's been you know really uh, no clarity because Title Four it, it really ends up being you know congressional purview, and absent Congress doing something about it, uh, we're gonna struggle and we're gonna interpret. Each one has a different sort of an interpretation of this as well, and and I think uh, really for our nation it's a pretty significant challenge. Because in interpretation, we're going to be misapplying these things as well. So that's a, a challenge that we've got that we need to be very mindful of. And I hope that, you know, the various entities that are involved in this enterprise, and I, you know, uh, Brian, if I may share this as well, I always say that education is a contact sport. And then engagement in Washington, D.C. is a contact sport. So you got to be involved in this. You know, it's not enough to, again, you know, yeah, well, you know, I, I don't know if I have any role to play in this. What can one person do? You know, I'm going to teach my thing and go home and it don't bother me or anything like right. that. But every one of us, imagine uh, we've got, what, uh, uh, 20 million uh, college age students, I believe, in America. And uh, and then all the the faculty and staff that go with it. And, you know, when if you can get the Imagine the power that uh, education has to be able to make things happen. And, and I think, you know, uh, uh, it is uh, reflective of this non-engagement in, you know, this contact sport that, uh, that really needs to happen as well. And, and people have got to be a lot more, you know, aware of and becoming engaged. I mean, we've seen that happening, you know, you know a couple of days ago uh, in the last few weeks with the elections and things like that as well. I hope that that energy that's there gets, you know, translated into particularly amongst our uh, you know, students and young people were all very engaged, as we've seen in our faculty and staff and others as well, to to convey this sense to uh, folks on Capitol Hill that we need these things to be fixed. Well, thank you. I like the uh, metaphor of a uh, contact sport here, which I think is uh, uh, very, very, uh, very strong. And thank you uh, for the uh, excellent question, uh, Chris. I really appreciate this. Uh, we have another uh, fairly technical question from uh, the excellent Charles Findlay at Northeastern. Uh, and Charles asks about badges. Will, with many learners seeking badges and certificates, will the accrediting agencies play a role? Or will there be other independent agencies? Okay, uh, I'm starting to click on my mute button. Um, so, yes, the short answer is yes. We are engaged in it. We're involved in it, uh, along with competency-based education and other things as well. And uh, a number of our institutions, I mean, already, you know, back in the in course, the good old days, many of our institutions started offering certificate programs, uh, professional master's degrees, and other, you know, micro-credentials and badges, uh, not badges, you know, these, this is all new terminology that's coming to play here. Uh, it's sort of the, the influence of the information technology uh, world that we live in today, right? And, uh, and so we've got now, we've got Google, you know, wanting to do their own uh, things. So you got Google University, and then you got Amazon Web Services, got its own Amazon University, or whatever else you've got going. Others, you know, Apple gave up a few years ago, and Microsoft gave up a few years ago. But there is this, you know, this this idea that you can monetize. You know, who cares? Who needs these universities and colleges? We can do it ourselves. Okay, that's that's the conversation we've got. But uh, you know, we what the, the approach that we take is if you as a college or a university, uh, you want to go ahead and develop these uh, uh, micro credentials and alternative credentials and things like that, go ahead and, and you know because your university or college is you know accredited, you know, but at the program level, if you're going, these are these are all in our uh, uh, situation, we refer to these things as substantive change. 
process. We have a very clear uh, path forward on how these things are done. So submit it. And a lot of our institutions are starting to do these things. Also, you know, partnering with online program managers to be able to, you know, have this or the back office management or whatever else that's going on as well. And what we do is we look at, you know, what is that badge going to do or that micro credential going to do? How is that going to result, uh, affect the student? And, you know, I used the metaphor of the honeybee uh, previously, right? I mean, students are wanting that. They want these different types of things that they want to incorporate into their under their belt. You know, it's not just a anymore. It's not a. I'm going to go and and my butts on the seat. You know, the old butts on seats uh, approach that we took. They come here four or six years. They're captive audience. Somehow they, you know, we do something. Somehow they get something. They get a, a sheet of paper that's got a, you know, says you got a diploma or whatever, and they go away. And but I think these these approaches of badges and credentials, et cetera, micro credentials, et cetera, are really, you know, pushing this idea of these experiential learning type things that they got to, you know, under the, the belt that the student has got, this portfolio. It's a portfolio of approaches that we've got. Students may take conventional courses. They may take get certificates along the way. They may get these badges along the way. They may get these micro credentials along the way. And not just on your campus. They may be getting it someplace as well. As well. So now what happens is in our, you know, in our uh, calculus, the college or university needs to be willing. You know, we have this prior learning and transfer of credit, all manner of things that are set up that needs to be thought of as well. Does a badge have a clearly articulated learning outcomes? Does a badge have, you know, time that is invested and by the professor, by the student, what are the, you know, declared outcomes? What are the learnings that have taken place? These things need to be part of it as well for us from our perspective as an accreditor that we look at. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a portfolio of approaches that the institution are doing. And, and, you know, some of the universities that have really jumped on this, Arizona State University and others, uh, they're doing some, you know, really uh, interesting uh, approaches. Again, because the marketplace is driving it and the private sector is driving it in, in many ways as well. You've got a whole slew of... Uh, uh, folks that are running around saying, you know, come, I'll give you a badge or a certificate. And then, of course, you know, we accredit uh, Western Governors University, that is, and in, in, you've got Southern New Hampshire University and others that are really, uh, uh, you know, pushing the proverbial uh, model of education itself. And so, uh, so what I say is you are the, the best judge of what happens on your campus. Come and talk to me. And then we'll help you get to that to that place that you want to be. Thank you. Thank you. That's a that's a really really good answer. Um, we have a, a follow up question from Glenn McGee. Um, actually, it's he, he asks he says a few things. Ask a few things. I'm going to try and digest them into one. Uh, he's asking about COVID waivers from the Department of Education and how they interact with either campus quality or with substantive change approval processes. Yeah. Does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, because we're, we're doing it right now. And uh, so I can tell you that we have not uh, watered down our standards or requirements in terms of from as an accreditor. And uh, uh, but we recognize, as I said, you know, the, I use the terms grace and kindness, right? There are some challenges that some institutions are facing. We got to take that into account as well, but we're not going to water down our standards or anything like that. We still have to adhere to what has already been articulated and things like that. And so we take that sort of an approach in, in working with the institutions, uh, even in this context of the, the COVID-19 itself. Now, uh, pandemic itself. Uh, recall back in March, and in fact, uh, my cohorts and I at the the Council for Regional Accrediting Council uh, uh, Commissions uh, were one of the first ones to go to the uh, Department of Education to be able to, you know, get us, in quotes, the flexibilities and waivers and things like that, including for us to be able to do virtual uh, evaluation visits and things like that as well. And so that was put together and that was extended, by the way, through the 31st of December of 2020. Currently, as it stands, in speaking with the, uh, uh, the staff at the Department of Education, not from the political uh, uh, appointees, but from the career staff, uh, they have said there is no further guidance on going beyond December the 31st, what we've, uh, of 2020, okay? There's a lot of uh, uh, misinterpretation 
and misinformation, if I may put it that way, that's being you know foisted around, but I've come across as well. And what we're trying, we're reminding uh, the, the, our institutions is the interpretation that you've got is incorrect. This is what the Department of Education staff is saying. So it stops December the 31st. So what we've done is to get our institutions to start going uh, to go through this process. If that, if they're not already authorized to do distance education delivery, no. they must submit to us an authorization. It's a substantive change proposal. They got to submit. And my staff does the exact same vetting that we've done previously before the pandemic and all that in approving institutions to go online for you know remote learning and things like that. And we're almost done. The very last of the institutions is you know being done literally uh, this week. We hope it's all going to be done. We just want to be on the safe side. Our institutions need to be on the safe side in case the flexibilities are extended. No problem. But you've already got this authorization, so you can continue on even into the future. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and so that substantive change process is a critically important process, and we've not watered down that at all. I can tell you that, uh, and and we we it's an iterative process. You know, if we've got questions, we'll ask them more questions and things like that too, and uh, so that's the approach that we've used in in the context of the the, the pandemic that we've got, uh, and then going back to what I said earlier as well in terms of the student learning outcomes and other things that we're looking for. And also uh, the disaggregated uh, data that we need in terms of uh, disaggregated by race, ethnicity, gender, et cetera. Uh, we, we, will, we are continuing to you know, track all of that as well. Well, I thank you for that really, really clear answer. And uh, Glenn thanks you in chat for the clarification. Um, like I said, you've got a whole range of questions coming at you from the community. Um, and that we have time for one last question. Uh, and this is from uh, Nicholas Santilli um, at the uh, Society for College University Planning. Uh, and he asks a, a very, very direct question. What are some of the areas of institutional operations that your member institutions continue to struggle with in preparing for reaffirmation reviews? Wow, Nick. Good to see you. I, saw, I think I saw you kind of flash by on my screen here uh, uh, below uh, mm -hmm. uh, Brian's and, and my uh, images that I see in my monitor here. And uh, I think a couple of things here, uh, Nick, and, uh, uh, and you and I have talked a little bit about this previously as well. One of which uh, I'm going to invoke uh, a, a favorite line from a favorite movie of mine, which is uh, Cool Hand Luke. And some of you may remember that you're old enough that you, if you saw that movie, uh, Strother Martin's character, he's the warden in the movie, just to bring everybody up to speed. And it's a Paul Newman film, by the way. And it's about these prisoners and things like that. And Strother Martin's uh, character says, what we have here is a failure to communicate. So that's one thing that our institutions, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I don't know what it is. And, and Nick, you know this from, a, you know, your own you know, background and perspective and all that, institutions that are really engaged in communication, you know, not just one way I'm going to tell you what to do and all that, but there's this engagement that is taking place. They're doing, you know, really, really well. The second one is in the world that you live in and work in, planning. And uh, really, and the plans are not something that are done and, you know, ends up, uh, you know, oh, yeah, we're going to do a strategic plan. Everybody in the uncle does it. Every time you get a new president coming, yeah, we're going to do a strategic plan. And then it goes the, on the shelf behind uh, Brian's head there, goes on that bookshelf there, and it collects dust. And then five years later or whatever, another president comes, yeah, yeah. We're it. But it's not a living, breathing, dynamic uh, plan. Uh, and it, it's a very static uh, sort of a thing. But there's not this sort of an evaluation that takes place. They're you know, tracking, you know, using dashboards or whatever else you're doing. You know, maybe it's a piece of paper and, and a pencil or whatever, but tracking what's going on and then, and then making those, uh, those needed uh, modifications as we go along. So, uh, you know, those are a couple of things that uh, really are critically important uh, to think of as well. Nick, uh, thanks you. Um, and um, and uh, I thank you, uh, partly for that excellent answer to that uh, um, really almost plaintive question. Um, and uh, I also have to thank you very much for your participation in this hour, because this hour is done. We have just rocketed through uh, 60 minutes of, uh, of conversation. 
thank you so much for, uh, for uh, so generously, so generously the questions, and, questions and, 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 and sharing. Yeah, thanks a bunch, Brian, for having me. This is a lot of fun. I like this uh, shindig uh, platform as well, and appreciate your you know uh, listeners uh, participating. So if you've got you know those of you that are like me, you know, quiet and reserved and all that, don't say much at all. You know, <laughs> send me an email, please, uh, if you've got any further questions. Sunny, very simply, my first name S O N N Y at nwccu.org. Send me a, a question. I'll, I promise you I'll, I'll respond to you. I try to respond within 24 hours, and but it may take a little longer. depends. just depends. But I will answer you. Thank you. You will. You will. Thank you so much. So much. Uh, we'll we'll be safe. Be safe. All right. All right. Be safe, everybody. Take care. Thank you very much. Now, don't go, uh, don't go I have to let uh, you know uh, uh, where things are going for the next few weeks. Uh, so, And again, let me thank you all for the fantastic range of questions. From everything from the existential nature of uh, accrediting agencies to very specific details about policy. Bravo. Uh, so uh, just quickly, uh, we have our quick poll about uh, forum operations for the next four months or so. So just head to uh, surveymonkey.com slash r slash FTF 2020. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Again, it's only going to take you a minute to do.